I keep trying to think of something witty to say, and there's just nothing there. So I guess let's get started on web application development. I mean, there's there's nothing in my brain right now. I just had like this giant cup of sugar with a little bit of coffee in it, and I was hoping that would help. It's not helping. It's not. It's there's nothing. There's nothing happening up here. So when I thought about how to show you folks what web application development is like. Um, I thought about, can I do like the BuzzFeed version of this, or what can I tell you? And, and the truth is, is the best idea that I came up with to teach you about what web application development is like is just to tell you what web application development was like for Halo at Microsoft. So a lot of you are really interested in the games industry. A lot of you are really interested in uh, working for Microsoft. They're a great employer in the area, big, um, lots of jobs available, and a lot, a lot of jobs are available in games. If you are somebody who's got a great reputation as a, a front-end or services web developer for uh, the, the nerd industry in gaming, you're going to be good to go when it comes to a career. So what I thought I would do is just start taking some, maybe give you a couple of stories and then start taking some questions about what was it like working with Master Chief hanging over my shoulder all day long. Um, so the first thing that I recall uh, when I got brought in, first of all, Halo was actually my second job, but the reason that it's um, it's a better example was the first uh, Xbox game that I was on, which was Lips for Xbox. I was the lead web dev for it, but really what I was doing was liaising among a lot of different people, and so it was a little bit less like I was working on a team there, and more like um, I was I was sort of isolated with a lot of fingers um, pointing out to grab code from a lot of different places. I was actually on a team team at Halo, and it's a great example of what web application development is like. There's a lot of different stuff that goes into it. First of all, does anybody know what I mean when I, when I talk about the difference between web development and web application development? Do you know what I'm talking about? What, what, is, an what is a web application, a web app? Best guesses. An application on a website. That's actually, that's, a, that's fine. That's actually a pretty good definition of it. One of the differences between web development and web application development is in web development, you might have a flat site that's nothing more than just information put up there. You might be someone whose job it is to make it look good, make it uh, connect to other locations. But a web application usually has to do with processing data, with interfacing with customers or clientele. It might have something to do with processing payment information or taking information from customers or users of the site and working with that information in some fashion. Serving advertising based on targeted content is a really good example of a web application. Facebook is a web application, not just a website. It, it is an entire suite of applications, as a matter of fact. But um, So when I say that I was on the Halo team, what I mean there was that I was, I was on the team that created and brought unto the world Halo.com, xbox.com, forums for Halo, the, the suite of websites that were out there to serve the Halo community. And a lot of the stuff that we did was make sure that um, the, the leaderboards were accurate based on the data that was available to us from Xbox. We made sure that the site looked right, that updates to the front page of the website, to all of the services that people could get their hands on looked good. Um, I did mostly front-end web development and interfaced with the services people. There's a lot of data that floats around behind websites. When you look at something like Facebook or Halo or any major website, what you're looking at is an application, not just the flat site. There's a reason it knows, hi, Joe, you're here at Facebook. And a lot of that has to do with things like uh, authorization and logins and maintaining persistent user information. Um, an excellent, also an excellent example of a web application is the maintenance of user information in a database so that you can do things like track how your users are using your site. You can do that in, in aggregate, you can do it more specifically, but one of the major things that I was in charge of was making sure that um, the, the, the look and feel of Halo was consistent across all of the, the websites that we served. So we weren't just, just Halo.com, we also had to do things like make sure that um, the, the look and feel of overall xbox.com brought its um, bits and pieces over into the Halo site as well. So you can think of it as a loosely confederated set of services that all go pull data from someplace. Can you let her in? Um, all go pull data from someplace and maybe display it in interesting and useful ways that people interact with. Does that make sense? So what questions do you have about what it's like to work for Halo? 
Xbox, games, Microsoft, specific to web application development. What is a glitch? That's actually a really good question. Um, so if you want to just, you can go around the back, I would guess, or just that way. It doesn't matter to me. Um, so a glitch is a clutch. It's a bug. It just means something went wrong. Um, it's, a, it's a word that I might use to describe something that I don't understand that didn't go right, but when I tried turning it off and turning it back on again, it worked itself out. Um, there are glitches and gremlins and clutches and bugs, and they all describe different states of mind of the person who is describing them depending on the amount of profanity laced in front of said word. So, which I do my best to avoid, but you know, what are you gonna do? Um, I've been known to sound like Richard Pryor on a bender, so especially when staring at a machine that just will not work. How many of you have ever heard the, or have ever watched the television show, The IT Crowd? There we, okay, three new favorite students, awesome, okay. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? Exactly. So, and for those of you who haven't, that is your new assignment. Just ignore everything else that I've said for homework for the rest of the class. Watch that, and actually, that's probably the, I'm not, I'm not serious. But no, I'm kind of serious, actually. That's one of the greatest introductions you might possibly get to, to the culture of life on the internet and what stuff is like, is the IT crowd. It's an awesome one. Okay. So web applications have multiple different layers. You heard me describe myself as a front-end web developer. What does that mean to you? Um, I mean, front-end, you're just uh, here, okay. developing more of what you see. Exactly. I, I, am disc I am developing what you see. An another way to put that would be that I am client-facing. So remember, servers and clients. That's what all of this stuff is. Either you're the, the entity that has the stuff, or you're the entity that wants the stuff. And I'm the one who made sure that the, that the client-facing applications were syncing properly with the servers. When something didn't show up right on the front end, I was the one that would go track down where in the, the processes that information wasn't coming to the front of the web app. Um, there are lots of different parts to web applications. In modern web development, we talk about something called multi-tier architecture. What are some of the possible parts of multi-tier architecture? You've heard me say words that, that all go into making up multi-tier architecture before. One of them is the website. Um, yeah. The front end. Database. Database. Heard me talk about services yet? OK, there's services. Multi-tier architecture is not only physical, it is also something that we conceive of as a way to switch out a piece of a big application without affecting the end users. If you want to, you can redo an entire website from PHP to Python, and the users might never know the difference by the time you're done rewriting everything because you have switched everyone over from a site that they're not seeing in PHP to a site that they're not seeing in Python. But what you've done is made sure that if Python is what you're doing to go back to the database and you're using a Python script to pull information from it and show it up front, um, it's doing the same thing as, as a PHP script would do, right? So you could switch out those two scripts. That is what we, that is the, that is a simple example of what we would call multi-tier architecture. Database storage is another really good example of that. There's lots of different kinds of databases. The ones that you're gonna be most familiar with probably coming out of this program um, are probably MySQL and maybe Postgres. What other DBs have, have any of you heard of? Databases, have any of you heard of? Other than Postgres and MySQL? Any at all? CouchDB? SQL? Oh, yeah, SQL. Well, we, when I, when I, you can say SQL if you want to, but you can also just call it SQL if you want to. SQL means structured query language. So the, the, um, the letters SQL appended onto things often mean that what we're talking about is a relational database. And we'll talk more about that next week when we get into to what databases are and what they do. But for now, just assume they're a big bucket that stores stuff. So you can switch out the bucket that holds all the stuff if you want to. I mean, you're in, in, in metaphoric terms, you're taking a big bucket over here and a big bucket over here, dumping everything from one bucket into the other, and then everybody knows to go to the new bucket to pull stuff out and look at it if they want to. That is another piece of what we would call multi-tier architecture. You can also, without affecting the database, without affecting the scripts that go and find stuff, you could also do something like change the pictures on the front end of the site. And that was the piece of the multi-tier, and, and, and while it's, there's, there's more to it than switching out pictures, as a front-end web developer, you're not somebody who is designing anything. I, I, can't, I can't draw a straight line. 
or a circle or a stick. My stick figures are embarrassing. So I, I'm, not, I'm not much of a visual artist. I have to be told how many pixels something is supposed to be before I know where to stick it on the page. Fortunately, that's what QA and, and testers are for in the, in the web world. So that's what you do when you are a web application developer, is you get tickets that say the um, leaderboards are not displaying the correct leaderboard information right now. They're displaying information from a month ago, or um, they are randomly flickering in and out and we don't know why, or um, the text on the front end of the site um, does not match up with the Xbox standards and so you need to switch out the CSS to use the correct font. Upload the correct font, make that all work. Those are the kinds of tickets that I would get and I would work on. And you, you turn into a little bit of a detective when you do stuff like that. You do the best that you can to figure out what the other person was talking about when they said, it doesn't look right. And you go, okay, well, ticket says, it doesn't look right. What do they mean by, it doesn't look right? <laughs> and then you start tracking back and you, you go on a, little, on a little hunt to figure out what the problem was. And then you talk to the services engineers and the database administrators and engineers and figure out why isn't the information showing up the way that it's supposed to. And then you make it show up and then you figure out why it doesn't look like it's supposed to when it shows up, and then you fix the CSS file. Then you fix the CSS file some more. Then after that, you might fix the CSS file. So there's a whole lot of CSS that you have to worry about when it comes to web application development because that's where you're displaying and positioning things. If you want to get good at something fast that's going to get you a job pretty quickly, CSS is an excellent option. So is JavaScript, by the way. JavaScript involves a lot of the dynamic things that you're seeing on the front end of a site. What happens when you see, um, say you type your name in into a form on the front end of a web page and you click away from that, that field. And you don't push any buttons, but maybe a message pops up that says, hi Tara, if I've typed in my name. You, you haven't submitted anything, you haven't clicked anything, you haven't made a call, what's happening there? What's that? It is actively listening and what that's called is Ajax, okay? So the, the the major portion of Ajax involves JavaScript and that is you might think of it as something that's sitting there in the background listening for what's happening on the page and constantly monitoring those fields that you might be typing in and going this looks a little strange or that looks right I'll let you keep going. Anytime you've ever typed in a password and then you type in the one below it it says this doesn't match. Yeah, the same thing where if you enter a credit card number and it says that it says it's mm -hmm. If you enter a credit card number and it doesn't have the, the correct number of digits, absolutely. That's form validation also that's happening via JavaScript. So, yes, excellent example. So those are the parts of being a, a web application developer. What do you want to know about working at Halo or Microsoft or web apps? How many people were on your directory? I don't remember, but the answer is anywhere from 5 to 80. So depending on how you define the team, I, I, would, I would think. I have to be careful not to answer too many. Well, so I can answer questions that are about what it's like and the, and the stuff, but I can't, I, there are some questions I can't answer because of confidentiality. So I, I won't be able to be like, and here's where all the passwords are stored. <laughs> so you know, what questions that are not involving things that will get me sued that I can answer? Yes. Were you on a contract or were you an employee? That is an excellent question. I was a contractor. Um, I, was what, I was what was called a V-dash contractor there. So yeah, that is a sharp question, by the way. Are you looking to become a contractor or go into FTE? Oh, I was a contractor for Microsoft. OK. A-dash or V-dash? V. OK, yeah. So and that what that means is that you, okay, long explanation, but we're going to go into more of what the difference between FTE and contracting and 1099 is when we talk about careers a little later on in the term. Any other questions? Yes. So is your main role I did a lot of different things. Um, the, the, when you do something like front-end development, often what you're doing is responding to people as opposed to implementing on your own, especially in a big team like that. So while I would be given tasks, the way to complete them was up to me. Uh, but I would, and this is very common for any developer on any team, um, you are often given a task that is very nebulous and you have to figure out what somebody meant when they told you that and then you have to fix it without necessarily having any clear conditions of fixing things. And the difference between somebody who is what we might call just a coder and a developer is a coder looks at it and goes, you didn't tell me what to do. And a developer goes, I think I understand what's happening here. And then figures out a solution and implements it um, like, you know, there's a script that needs to go here. And by the way, this also sucks while I'm working on this, so I'm going to fix this while I'm doing it too. And then you you go back and it's, it's a lot more latitude, a lot more creativity, and a lot higher skill set to be a developer. 
to um, to look at, at, a, at a ticket and it says, doesn't look right. <laughs> and you look at it and go, okay, I see what they're talking about, but, but then you sit down and go, okay, there's a whole long list of things that are going to go into figuring out what the problem is, getting it to display right, um, writing the code that's going to change what's going on, figuring out where the code's coming from that's making this wrong in the first place. And the single most irritating thing about almost all web application developments is replicability of whatever you've been looking at. So figuring out when someone says, you know, every once in a while when I click on this button, a thing happens. Um, you, you, you hope and you pray that they've gotten a screenshot of whatever it is that they're talking about, but often you have to develop your own tests to figure out what they were talking about. So because they're right, if, if they're clicking on something and every once in a while a thing happens, that's important to know. And there's a certain level of tolerance that we have for that in technology. If a thing happens when you click on a button every 17 million times, first, it's probably not going to get caught in production. Um, second, it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, and third, probably not going to spend a lot of time and energy on it. But what if it happens one out of every 500 times? and you're serving a community as we were of millions of users, then it matters. Then you have a substantial subset of people who are, who are experiencing a problem and probably multiple different, possibly duplicate bug reports. Um, so then you would look at it and go, okay, well, if this is happening once every 500 or 1,000 times, I need to figure out a way to automate the process of trying to make it happen again, automate the process of catching whatever that activity was, then figure out what just happened, track it down, smash it, and then come back with the solution for the problem. So, and that it's, it's, crea it's a lot like being a, a technical detective, actually, and it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy that, that portion of web application development. It can be wildly frustrating, but at the same time, it's very much like being a detective. There's a lot of scope for the stuff that you're working on, huge teams, huge, um, and, and, and that's gonna be true of basically any major tech company that you're working for in the area. You could work at Starbucks and experience the same thing. They've got a lot of web applications, too, so. What other questions? You all know everything you need to know now to go get a job as a web app developer. Uh, what? Uh, you kind of mentioned before, mm -hmm. like the stuff and then how How many programming languages that work with? Um, so I would typically on almost on almost any given day, and this is going to be. I'll generalize this because I am. I, I don't think it's any secret what languages people would use as a front-end web developer, but on a general basis, you were, you were going to be using HTML, you're going to be using CSS, you're going to be using uh, JavaScript, certainly, you're going to be using whatever different plugins or modifications of JavaScript are required, like jQuery is a really common one. It's a set of, of standard applications in JavaScript. Um, you will certainly be using whatever back-end programming language, object, likely object-oriented language, the web application itself is written in. So it could be C++ or Java or C Sharp or Objective C or any of the any of the uh, any of the major object-oriented languages usually are a possibility. Um, Python certainly is a big one now. So Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Ruby on Rails is a web application framework, and Ruby is the language that it's written in. Okay, um, that's a good question. Yes, and then of course you'll need to know at least some of whatever database language or query process you're getting information from. So, of course, at Microsoft, and it's not a secret, you'd be using SQL Server everywhere, um, and whatever interfaces that they permit you to have with that. And then, of course, there's always client-facing applications, too. Sometimes you're interfacing with third parties. Sometimes third parties use things like Apache in a Windows environment, which is crazy hard to set up. So, you know, the more languages you know, to some extent, the better. And yet, all you really need to know is one. You need to know your primary original programming language really well. At that point, everything is just dialects. Learning, um, learning C++ after you know Java is not like learning Spanish after learning Mandarin. It is like learning the difference between the southern accent in Texas and the southern accent in South Carolina. That's, that is the difference between the two. You, you will still be able to talk and figure it out, but there are going to be some, some bits and pieces that you're going to have to switch out and some weird uses of language that all of a sudden mean the exact opposite and that screw everything up. But once you figure those things out, you're okay. Um, I, I probably learned C Sharp in a week or two, you know, because I knew my original object-oriented language really well. What other questions do you have? Yes? Or 
to call them, oh, okay, that's a good question. When you, when you fix a lot of stuff at once and you call it a rollout, um, rolling out is something that can happen on tiny scale or on a giant scale. Um, I think what you're looking for is a release, maybe. So a release would be something that, that involves a major upgrade of features or a major bug fix. <laughs> and there's, there's a couple of philosophies about releases. One is that they are good and that you want to work towards a release and then everyone goes <gasps> when the release is done. Um, I don't like that perspective. I believe in a release-free environment involving um, perpetual constant test and rollout. Um, and that is because iterative development as opposed to release-based development is something that catches mistakes a lot faster. In a lot of ways, developing a, a major web application in an iterative fashion, if you get your rollouts correct, if you get your, your staging environment and rollouts correct, everything else just rolls into place. But prepping for and shipping major releases can not only create an artificial sense of pressure, but a relaxation after that release that causes a problem, I would think, with, with handling the bugs that are always part of a major release. Okay, there was another question? Oh. Yes. Um, so when you're working on a team like that, yes. is your physical space that you're literally right next to them working okay. on the table, or do you have your own desk? And when I'm when I'm working on a team like that, my physical space is, I mean, in, in almost any environment you're going to be in, in any company, you're going to be at a cubicle or have a desk, some kind of shared environment, probably open. Um, I, did a, I did a talk at Facebook a couple of months ago, and they just have an open environment where everybody's got a desk. So that's often what, what will happen at this point. Um, space is at such a premium right now in Seattle that people just don't have enough room to give everybody offices. I had to office as Microsoft originally, but they just, they filled up, so... Um, you'll also find that offices are priorities uh, for for FTEs as opposed to contractors in most companies. So, what's that? A uh, full-time employee. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Very cool.